and open the room. Okay, so just give it a second there, Andy. Okay. You're, otherwise, you guys are all live now to go. Great, thanks so much. Oh, Jenny, I don't think we decided. Are you doing the introduction, this part? Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, I saw the email, sorry, I didn't respond. Okay. <laughs> Okay, Jennifer, we seem to be uh, full house here so far. Great. All right, we'll give it, I would say, another minute or two for people to trickle in, and then we'll get going. Everyone is here. Thanks for coming. You want to go ahead, Jenny? Yeah, yeah, we can get started. Um, all right, thank you everyone so much for coming to this year's uh, master's three-minute thesis competition. For those who aren't familiar with three-minute thesis, it's essentially a competition that's held at universities all around the world that challenges grad students to talk about their thesis or dissertation in a really concise and engaging way that is accessible to a non-technical audience. So they're really fun presentations to watch, and we hope you guys enjoy this group of finalists. Um, this group was chosen based on their abstract scores and already doing really well there. And then in addition, they all participated in a preliminary round prior to the conference this year. So we're really excited to have them all presenting live for the final competition. So just a quick overview on how this session is going to go is we're just doing a quick introduction right now, and we'll talk about a couple of quick technical things. And then Andy or myself, who is my co-host here, um, that we did not introduce ourselves. So we should pause quick. <laughs> Andy, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, Andy Carduna, uh, faculty in human physiology at University of Oregon. Great, and I'm Jenny Leaf. I'm a PhD student at Georgia Tech. So with that intro, halfway through, we'll keep going. So. Um, either Andy or myself will introduce each of the uh, finalists as we go along. Each will be giving a three minute talk um, and we have 10 finalists that will be presenting today. We also have some anonymous judges in the audience who are going to be choosing the finalists and the runner up for this competition. And we will also be holding a People's Choice Award vote at the end. So if you uh, can stick around for all of the talks, we'd really love to uh, get your opinion on the People's Choice Award vote. Uh, the winner, runner-up, and People's Choice Award for both the Master's and the PhD session are going to be announced at the ASB Closing Ceremony Business Meeting on Friday, so be sure to tune in there. Um, Andy, if you want to flip to the next slide. Just a couple technical things to overview really quickly um, is uh, because of the way the three-minute thesis usually goes and the way that uh, all of these candidates design their slides for the preliminary round, we encourage you to watch um, their presentation and speaker view 
we will highlight each candidate or spotlight them so it stays on their picture. And if you just want to stick their video in the upper right hand corner, there should be kind of a blank place on all of their slides so it's not blocking any content. And then kind of last logistical thing is there's not going to be live Q&A during the session, but um, there is a Slack channel. It's hashtag discussion three minute thesis. And feel free to head over there um, during the session or afterwards if you want to connect with any of the finalists on their presentation or have questions for them. So that kind of covers all of the logistics out front. Um, Andy, I'll hand it over to you to introduce the first speaker. Okay, great. Uh, I think we have a really good lineup here. As Jenny said, um, they all presented videos uh, that were judged asynchronously. Uh, watched them all. They're all fantastic. So I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, what they have to share with you today. Um, so our first, oh, so just a, a one thing is there are three minute talks. We've allocated uh, five minutes for, for each that allows for any um, introduction, any problems at the end, and it gives the judges just a couple of minutes to, to jot any notes down. So uh, our first speaker um, is uh, Heather uh, Vanderhoff. Uh, she's in the MS program in kinesiology at the University of Texas in El Paso. And uh, Jenny, if you want to let me know yep. when she's spotlighted. You are spotlighted and good to go. Okay, Heather, whenever you're ready. Sorry, you're muted. Oh, yeah. Okay, we, let's see. <laughs> One second. There okay, we go. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay, awesome. So typically when we think of falls or research related to falls, we think of populations such as the elderly or individuals with neurological impairment. So it may surprise you that the pregnant population actually falls at rates similar to that of the elderly population. Now the implications of a fall within this population are not quite the same as the elderly. But it's important to note that a fall severe enough could lead to not only injury, but hospitalization or loss of a fetus. So previous research has attributed um, falls being, I'm sorry, not falls, <laughs> has attributed the gestational masking to alter balance and postural control. So the aim of this study was to measure balance um, within the pregnant population for both bilateral standing and unilateral standing and comparing um, anterior posterior and medial lateral, medial lateral directions um, for these tasks. So 13 participants were recruited. They were within one of the following categories being second trimester, third trimester, or postpartum, and they were compared to non-pregnant controls. In order to measure their postural sway, the participants stood on a force platform for 30 seconds during bilateral and unilateral conditions. The results revealed that pregnancy did not have an impact on balance um, regardless of uh, trimester or condition. However, for all females, the anterior posterior sway was greater than the bi was greater than the medial lateral sway in bilateral conditions, but the single limb condition was not significantly different in either direction, suggesting that the single limb stance was evenly distributed in sway and postural control. Now this is surprising seeing that gestational mass and its anterior load about the body is uneven. It didn't have an effect on sway in either direction according to their um, stage of pregnancy. So further uh, research will actually examine the kinematics involved and not just the kinetics therefore to determine if there is a postural control uh, that's outside of just the sway in order to, um, sorry, <laughs> determine um, what that uh, postural control is being attributed to. Great, thank you very much, Heather. Thanks. Great job. And I apologize. Um, for advancing the slide prematurely. Uh, so uh, I wish I had some like fun facts to share. Um, if anyone has a joke, uh, this might be a good time. Um, but uh, just gonna give a, the judges another minute or so uh, before we move on to the, the next talk.
Okay, I'm looking at my phone and it's at, well, mine says 1010. Um, so why don't we go ahead um, and move on to the next talk. So let me advance that. So our next uh, speaker is uh, Lindsay Lawn. Uh, she is an MS student in mechanical engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. So Lindsay, uh, Jenny, if you wanna spotlight her and Lindsay, whenever, start whenever you're ready. Have you ever considered how many times you turn while moving around your house in the morning? I'm assuming your answer is probably no. For most of us, we don't have to think about the obstacles we encounter around our own home. But for an individual post-stroke, something as mundane as walking around a house can be extremely intimidating simply because of the amount of movement required. Thankfully, there is ample post-stroke rehabilitation that teaches individuals how to walk straight from the kitchen to the living room. But what do they do when they have to maneuver around the couch or turn around to shut off the shower? Unfortunately, research says they fall, and more often than not, they get hurt. My research focuses on identifying measures that clinicians can target during rehabilitation to help improve post-stroke turning. Specifically, my hypothesis is this. Impaired muscle coordination in individuals post-stroke leads to poor turning performance. Now to test this hypothesis, I analyzed post-stroke and healthy individuals as they performed a 180 degree turn. Individuals walked down to the end of the room, turned around and walked back while we measured their muscle activity and body motion. We use this data to quantify muscle coordination using the concept of muscle modules. Now a muscle module is a group of muscles that can be activated together to perform a particular movement. To complete a complex task smoothly and efficiently, an individual must use a combination of muscle modules. Unfortunately, after a stroke, many individuals aren't able to properly control their muscles and often use a lower number of modules to complete a task. Therefore, a lower number of modules represents impaired muscle coordination. Then, to quantify turning performance, we calculated three measures the time taken to complete the turn, the number of steps required to complete the turn, and the smoothness of performing the turn. Through our, our analysis, we came to two important conclusions. First, individuals post-stroke with the lowest number of modules and most impaired muscle coordination took longer to turn, use more steps, and had less smooth movement. Thus, as expected, improved muscle coordination needs to be a rehabilitation target in the clinic for individuals post-stroke. Second, in order to prescribe effective therapy in the clinic, it is important to accurately assess the degree of impairment of an individual. There was a strong correlation between the time to complete a 180 degree turn and the degree of impaired muscle coordination. This result suggests that the time it takes to complete a 180 degree turn may be an effective clinical assessment tool. Simply stated, this research is important because it can help individuals post-stroke navigate the cluttered and often chaotic environments they encounter in their daily lives. Thank you. Great, great job, Lindsay. Thanks a lot. So again, we'll just take a short, awkward break here. Um, what can I share? Oh, I, I, hopefully I'm not butchering this, but uh, the history of the 3MT, where it came from, is uh, I believe, and I can check this and come back, um, that there was a water shortage, um, I think in Queensland, and uh, people were only permitted to take three minute showers. So you had a little like egg timer or something you turned and that's the amount of time you had in the shower. And while someone was using this, they were trying to you know, envision what, what they could do in that three minutes and how they could share their, their research. And that was the genesis of the three minute thesis. At least that's the way it's, it's explained on their website. 
That's awesome. Now you need uh, seven more 3MT fun facts ready to go. Yeah, I, I have none of them, but uh, I'll <laughs> see what I can come up with. There we go. So just give another pause here. Let me go ahead and advance slide. Great. Okay. Uh, are we good yep. to go, Jenny? Yep. Okay, so we'll go ahead with our, our next uh, speaker. The third speaker um, is Inbar Kimma, uh, is an MS student in industrial engineering and management at uh, Ben Gurion uh, University. And whenever you're ready, we'll start. Walking is a fundamental task. Imagine yourself not being able to do it. How do you feel about it? Guy, in the left picture, was born with cerebral palsy, which is in damage to the development of the brain. Guy's dream is to walk like his good friend Sam. Even though Guy and Sam have the same cognitive abilities, Guy's muscles are stiff and have low flexibility, which makes it difficult for him to perform basic movements. Our goal is to help Guy fulfill his dream. So, we need to understand how a muscle function, especially with cerebral palsy. Well, while we know that muscles gather energy from oxygen, we still don't know how muscles of individuals with cerebral palsy use oxygen. Therefore, in our innovative research, we investigated the oxygen mechanism of the muscles of people with cerebral palsy doing activity compared with, with individuals with no physical impairment. In our research, we use a non-invasive technology called near-infrared spectroscopy, which provides information about the blood flow and oxygen level in the muscles. The comparison between the two groups was done during a one-minute knee extension with weights. We included two levels of effort in which to use different weights. The first level was relatively easy but the second was difficult and required a great effort. We found that muscle oxygen level during rest was slightly higher for individuals with cerebral palsy than people with no physical impairment. In addition, we found that participants with cerebral palsy managed to lift 40% less weight. First, when the blood flow and oxygen consumption were tested during exercise, we found that were lower for people with cerebral palsy. Possible explanation for this result is related to the lack of activity of individuals with cerebral palsy due to the difficulties in movement. In other words, the less they move, the less the muscle function. In conclusion, near infrared provides an insight to the functioning of muscle of, indi of individuals with cerebral palsy. However, Despite the limitations, we believe that customized training will improve their efficiency and functionality. That is, we are now investigating the influence of different training protocols in order to build customized clinical treatment to, to individuals with cerebral palsy that will enable Guy and many others like him to realize their dream to keep walking. Great, great job, yeah. Inbar. Thank you yeah. so much. This lack of clapping is, I understand. <laughs> I'll take care of it. <laughs> great, thanks. Uh, so, uh, I the next our, our next speaker um, actually is not able to present uh, due to some personal issues. So we have a, a recorded video that I'm going to uh, share with you. Um, but in our awkward silence time. Uh, <laughs> Since Jenny wanted more trivia, the first 3MT competition was uh, in um, 2008, and currently it, the 3M competition is held in over 900 universities across more than 85 countries around the world. Now I think I might be out of trivia. <laughs> All right, so while we're doing this, let me uh, get... Video. How often do you? All right. 
is the can can you see that jenny yep yep looks the sound, good the sound was you when i started accidentally playing you could hear it yeah yeah okay. sound again all right okay so um without further ado um i'd like to virtually introduce uh kavya Ketagam, uh as an ms student in kinesiology at Penn State University. And I'm gonna go ahead and just play her video. How often do you find yourself slumped on the sofa staring at your phone? Instead of spending time outdoors, children nowadays seem to prefer less physically active forms of entertainment. And I can't help but wonder what must be happening to their bodies as they grow. The prevalence of an inactive childhood is a major health concern today. Globally, 80% of school-aged children fail to meet the daily minimum recommendation for physical activity. What is this inactivity doing to the way that these children move? Specifically, how might this be altering their musculoskeletal systems? I've been particularly interested in what inactivity during childhood does to our tendons. Tendons are crucial for proper movement as they store and release energy to transmit muscle-generated forces to move our bodies. If our tendons don't function normally, we can't move normally. It's possible that chronic inactivity during childhood could alter the way that our tendons function. Now this link between inactivity and growth is a difficult question to tackle. Previous attempts have been made which observe a growing child who's minimally active for a short period of time, such as several weeks. These studies help us understand the short-term effects of inactivity during growth, but can only provide us with a small snapshot of the big picture. This is where our lab comes in. We came up with a pretty unique solution to this inability to study the entire 18-year growth period in humans. Birds. I'm talking about guinea fowl. Birds that locomote bipedally, just like humans. With this avian model, we can observe from infancy to adulthood in just six months. We studied guinea fowl that grew from one week to six months old in two very different conditions. One group was allowed to exercise freely while the other sedentary group was allowed to stand and walk but never run or jump, the high intensity activities that children normally partake in when they play. We surprisingly found no differences in the way that their tendons developed. Despite differences in physical activity, our birds grew up to have tendons that strained similarly under load. It seems that if there's just enough loading through essential walking and standing, tendon is resilient and able to maintain proper growth and function. However, further studies done in our lab found that after a childhood of sedentary behavior, movement performance is worse. The chronically inactive birds can't jump as high as their more active counterparts. We concluded that the differences in their performance might be due to adaptations in other parts of the musculoskeletal system or possibly even neurological changes. But for now, you can rest easy when you find yourself slumped on the sofa staring at your phone. Just make sure you also do some standing and walking or go get active. Either way, our tendons, if given just enough loading, know how to grow. I'll clap, even though she's not here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, great. So let's go back. Okay, again, just give a minute. Um, the only other trivia I can find is that uh, if there's an 80,000 word thesis, it would take nine hours to present, and we're having people do it in three minutes. Again, these are all from the 3MT website. I looked for trivia too, and I think I found the same page as you because I, yeah. the first two pieces were the first ones on there. <laughs> if anyone has any other 3MT trivia that they want to share, you can just send it to me in the chat, and I can use that at the next um, at the next break. All right. So, um, are we ready for the next? Yep. Okay, hold on. Okay, there? Yep, ready to go when you are. Okay, so our next uh, uh, speaker is uh, Talia Johnson, uh, working uh, on our MS in biomechanics at Penn State University 
and go ahead and start when you're ready. Our bodies are constantly trying to find ways in which we can do the most amount of work using the least amount of energy. Energy optimization is thought to be one of the hallmark features of animal locomotion. We know that over an evolutionary time scale, natural selection has resulted in unique adaptations that reduce the energy required to move. For example, have you ever heard someone say you have a spring in your step? Well, this can be quite literal for some animals. Horses have evolved to have spring-like muscles that reduce the energy required to gallop. And on a more acute time scale, humans select walking speeds and stride frequencies that minimize energy. But what about the adaptations that occur over an individual's lifespan? Can an animal continue to optimize its energy if it faces changes in its physical environment? Or even other factors such as how much they move or how much mass they have growing up. Now let's think about this. Can athletes train to be economical, thus being more efficient with their oxygen consumption? These are the type of questions that our lab is aiming to answer. We want to know whether locomotor energetics is plastic across an animal's growth period. Essentially, can locomotor energetics adapt based on the conditions you experience during your lifetime? This is not a question that can be easily answered using human subjects, being that they take around 20 years to grow. Here we used an animal model known as the guinea fowl, which allowed us to drastically change their limb loading history across their entire growth period. So starting at one week old, lead weights were added to their right leg so that their leg mass was now about 2.5 times heavier than normal. Imagine walking with a shoe that weighs about eight pounds. Now imagine doing this for the first 20 years of your life. This is similar to what the birds experience. We found, what we found was something never seen before. Amazingly, the birds that grew up carrying the leg weight were able to do so without any additional energy compared to those that grew up normally. In other words, they carried this enormous leg mass and did a lot of extra work, but at no extra cost. Imagine strapping on that eight pound shoe and not finding it any more difficult to walk. In comparison, when the birds that grew up normally carried that same leg weight, their energy increased by 35%. The fact that these animals were able to carry the load so economically suggests that local motor energetics is indeed plastic across the lifespan. It also suggests that maintaining low energy is a central feature of movement and muscle development. So our next steps are to explore what exact changes have allowed for these remarkable energetic adaptations. And with further analysis, we hope to understand whether what you do during childhood permanently, permanently affects your adult locomotor energetics. Thank you. Great job, Talia. All right. All right. Let me switch things over. Andy, I have no luck finding any more 3 MT trivia during the- All right, the best I could find year. is yeah, in, uh, at, um, Let's see, at University of Idaho, um, this is their catchphrase. Uh, one state, one scholar, one slide, and three minutes to give it all they've got. And if you can imagine that from like some booming voice, like from a movie trailer. <laughs> In a very dramatic voice, I like it. Very dramatic voice, yes. Take that note for next year. Uh, so we're at 1028, so uh, just- um, Delay uh, for- two. Yeah. Um, I guess this is a good, a good time to remind anyone who has trickled in um, that if you do have any questions for the presenters, feel free to head over to the Slack channel. Um, and additionally, just another reminder to please stay tuned at the end to participate in the People's Choice Award vote, which will occur right after all of the talks. There, that was our good uh, halftime break. All right, let me get Daisy ready to go. All right. This is the next one, I think. No, yep. I think why don't you I'm switching over? Yeah. Whenever you're, um, whenever you're ready. All, All right. right. So then, yes. Yeah. The next uh, speaker that we have is Daisy Vega, and she's an MS student in health and human performance at the University of Houston. Um, and let me make sure her video is ready to go. Yep, and Daisy, take it up. 
take it away whenever you're ready. All right. Locomotor training aims to restore the walking ability in individuals who have a neurological disorder, such as a spinal cord injury. This is accomplished by providing the patients with body weight support and stepping assistance. However, this usually requires several physical therapists or even an expensive robotic device. In addition, it has been proposed that coordinating the active use of the arms with the stepping motion of the legs may provide neural benefits. So given these insights, we designed a pretty simple rope pulley system, as seen on the left, where it connects the same sided limbs. We presume that as the arm swung back, it would help assist the leg during the leg swing phase of walking. However, our results showed otherwise. So here I present to you three layers of data. From a mechanical perspective, we found that the arms generated an assistive force, as seen here in panel A, during the periods of propulsion and leg swing initiation, which is highlighted in light gray. In turn, this caused changes to the horizontal component, but no changes to the vertical component of the ground reaction forces. What we found to be most profound was that there was a decrease in propulsive forces, specifically a 33% decrease in propulsive impulse occurred. Now to the right of this, we have the EMG activity. So this was normalized to normal walking and the bright red is the arm muscles and the light red is the leg muscles. What we found was that the arm muscles increased dramatically, specifically the triceps and the biceps were the primary muscles that contributed to the generation of this assistive force. At the same time, there was a decrease in the soleus and medial gastrocnemius muscles. So this clearly shows a neuromuscular shift characterized by higher arm muscle activity and lesser leg muscle activity during the propulsive phase of walking. So from a mechanical and muscular uh, perspective, we found that this helped decrease the leg's demand to push off the ground in preparation for leg swing. And lastly, to the right, we have the metabolic cost. Uh, we found that on average, a 17% reduction occurred. This means it reduced the effort to walk. What was most striking was that every subject responded in the same way, which is seen by these data points. So for um, our implications, this method could be integrated into locomotor training where the active use of active use of the arms may allow the user to become an active user instead of passive, and it may provide neural benefits via neural coupling. Thank you. Great job, Daisy. Let me switch things over. Okay, so I have some uh, snarky comments in the uh, Zoom chat. Someone asked uh, for some, uh, <laughs> some music, some theme music. So this is the best I can come up with. There you go. Great. And it's then picture the very answer. dramatic, the very dramatic nine hours, but you only have three minutes after right. that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let me switch over to the next one. All right. Well, we're on time from a technical standpoint, which is uh, making us leave a little room at the back end. Yeah, so just maybe let's wait a minute. Yeah. I found one more not quite as dramatic uh, intro to 3MT. One slide, three minutes, outstanding ideas. I think I like the, the 80,000 words, nine hours one a little bit better, though. All right, I'd say, Jenny, whenever you're ready to go ahead. All right. Um, so the next speaker that we have is Daniel Davis, and he's an MS student in kinesiology at Pennsylvania State University. Daniel, you can take it away whenever you're ready. Just waiting for this uh, to change. Yeah, so. sorry, Andy, you got to flip the slide. Forgot about that. There we go. All right, now take it away whenever you're ready. 
I'm going to give you a hypothetical task. I'm going to send a steady stream of specks of dirt your way, and intermixed in that dirt will be specks of gold. And I'll tell you that the specks of gold will actually vary in size with time. I'll also give you a strainer or a sifter with one uniform pore size. And I'd like you to separate out all of the gold from all of the dirt. Now you might be thinking the, the size of those gold specks is varying with time and I only have this one pore size. I'm not gonna be able to separate out all of the gold and remove all of the dirt. Now this kind of odd example will help us relate to a problem faced by researchers studying the motion of humans and other animals. For us, the gold in this example represents the signals from the measurement of body segments. And the size of the gold specks represent signal characteristics that can change with time. And these might change due to a change in the type of movement or maybe an abrupt movement, like during an impact. And while these signals are not actual specks of gold, they can be very valuable as they can help to inform clinical decision making, athlete performance, rehabilitation practice, and even product development. Now, the, the dirt in a research setting represents the measurement error or the noise. And even with modern high-tech equipment, there's still some noise that can contaminate our signals. There's still some dirt that remains. Now, that sifter that we talked about earlier being kind of suboptimal because it only had that one pore size, that represents how researchers commonly attempt to separate out the signal and the noise. And oftentimes this pore size is selected based on well, what will retain most of the gold? Uh, or maybe even just the pore size that some other researcher used. But what if the gold that we're missing, what if the signal characteristics that we're missing are the most important pieces? What if those could change outcomes or even lead to future innovations? Do we then have to adjust that pore size and just kind of accept more dirt or accept more noise? That's where my research comes in. First, I develop a method that's able to detect where there are sections in time where the signal characteristics are different or the size of the gold specks are different. Then I can use sifters with different pore sizes, to continue with that example, to retain more of the gold and get rid of more of the dirt. In a research setting, this means that I can be more confident that my results represent more of the signal of interest, more gold, and less of the noise, the dirt. Further, since my approach is both objective and automatic, researchers and non-researchers can readily implement it to hopefully move away from this single pore size approach, the current fool's gold standard, if you will. Thank you. Awesome, great job, Daniel. All right. There's a uh, question in the chat uh, about whether there's any link between the company 3M and the 3MT competition. <laughs> and to my knowledge, there is absolutely no connection between the two. All right. Let me switch everyone over again. Yeah, unless there's a connection between uh, Minnesota, where 3M is, and uh, down in Australia. Don't think the two could be tied together. All right. Okay. Um, one piece of info, too, for anyone who's thinking about asking questions in the discussion page. Uh, on the Slack channel, we just got word that we should head over to the Qualsys uh, room in spatial chat afterwards if you want to talk with any of the presenters. So that would be a great place to pop over afterwards, both for presenters and attendees. All right. And how are we on time? We're doing well. So whenever you want to start. Can I kick it off? All right, so the next speaker that we have is Hiroto Murata, and he is an MS a student in mechanical engineering at the Tokyo University of Science. And you are spotlighted and ready to start whenever you are. Okay. Running is a highly demanding task for Owarium amputees. However, underlying mechanics for running remain largely undescribed in this population. 
The final goal of our study is to open a new page for gait rehabilitation in lower limb amputees. Generally, the body bouncing mechanics is described by the mechanical energy of the body. The bounce is achieved by negative work to absorb the energy after landing, and the positive work to restore the energy before takeoff. In amputees running, negative work is equal to positive work for each step. Unilateral transfemoral amputees often use carbon fiber running a specific prosthesis when they run. My question is, how they bounce using morphological asymmetric legs, such as biological and the prosthetic legs. So the aim of this study was to investigate their bouncing strategy by variating the mechanical work of the body. In our experiment, eight unilateral transfemoral amputees round the instrumented treadmill at various running speed. This slide shows mechanical energy fluctuation during running in unilateral transfemoral amputees. Blue and red lines indicate the negative and the positive works respectively. And the yellow arrows indicate net mechanical works in both legs. And as you can see, the negative work in prosthetic leg was smaller than that in intact leg. Therefore, prosthetic leg has less capability to absorb the energy than intact leg. The positive work was almost similar between prosthetic and the intact legs. This may be because of energy storing and the return capabilities of carbon fiber thread. And then net mechanical works were totally positive in prosthetic leg, but negative in intact leg. As a result, there are periodic bounces were achieved by acceleration in prosthetic leg and the deceleration in intact leg at each step. In conclusion, unilateral transfemoral amputees would use asymmetric bounce strategy during running. Therefore, coaches and the therapists should consider the bilateral differences between lower limbs for running gait rehabilitation. Running is a highly demanding task for lower limb amputees still now, but we believe that these fundamental findings will open a new page for gait rehabilitation in lower limb amputees. Thank you. Great job. Yeah, thank you very much. And this here, this could potentially be our fun fact for the uh, time here. Are you currently in Tokyo? And if you are, what time is it there? Let's see, can you, I know you just muted yourself, we'll see. Okay, my okay, <laughs> Yeah, 2 a.m. Wow. Yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for sticking with us. Yeah, I don't know yeah, if I would have yeah, presented yeah. that well that that late into the night. Yeah, I also thank you very much for holding this kind of a uh, precious opportunity to me. Yeah, great. Thanks for participating. Great talk. All right. Let me switch over. You guys hear me? Yeah, sounds good. All right. Okay. Um, all right. One good second. To go. and yeah, good to go on that end. We're just running yep. a tiny bit ahead of time, but not too much. I think we're okay. Okay. All, all right. right. So the next speaker we have is Leo Song, and he is an MS mechanical engineering student at the University of Illinois Urbana Champaign. And Leo, you can take it away whenever you're ready. Mm -hmm. So Fitbit, iPhone, and Apple Watches, what do all of these have in common? Yes, they all made great holiday gifts, but they also have a single sensor that calculates the physical orientation of the device. For example, your phone knows if it's in a portrait or landscape orientation using a sensor called an inertial measurement unit, or IMUs for short. Now, these IMUs provide a solid uh, kinematic data for biomechanical and uh, clinical research studies. These IMU sensors are fairly small, less than the size of a quarter, and so it can be put into wearable devices. For example, researchers develop wearable IMUs to quantify the gait patterns of Parkinson's disease patients to optimize their treatment plans. 
But like with anything else in life, the IMUs have its own drawbacks. For example, the commercial lab-grade IMUs are fairly expensive, ranging from $150 to over $2,000 for a single IMU. And oftentimes, you need more than one. Also, it requires an expensive software package for IMU since it requires complicated algorithms. And speaking of which, the IMU algorithms developed by academic researchers are quite promising, but some of them are not thoroughly validated in experiments. And lastly, due to the lack of open source code, it's difficult to replicate these algorithms for biomechanics researchers who are not familiar with control theory. So we ask ourselves, how can we develop a low cost, accurate, and thoroughly validated IMU system for biomechanical and clinical researchers? Well, to answer that question, we purchased a low cost IMU chip, $3, and implemented commonly used algorithms found in the literature. We then developed a custom test bed to allow programmable and repeatable motions replicating the dynamics of a human knee during walking. It also provided a gold standard measurement, which allowed calculation of the IMU accuracy. We quantified what's called a root mean squared error, or RMSE. Now, the results showed that the IMU accuracy for the low cost IMU system had a root mean squared error of less than six degrees. Now this six degrees is important because it is a maximum allowable error for biomechanical studies. In fact, the, uh, in fact, the, um, oh, crap. in fact, the uh, accuracy was consistent through movement speeds of up to 200 degrees per second and test duration of up to 25 minutes. So to conclude, the low-cost IMU system shows promising results. We plan to share the hardware and software designs, as well as uh, video tutorials for other research groups to replicate our work. And we hope that this can lower the research and the financial barrier as well. So to all the biomechanics professors out there, why not share a link of our research to your grad students as a holiday gift? Thank you. And my apologies. Yeah, apparently. Yeah, that kind of threw me off a little bit. <laughs> I'm very sorry about that. I, um, it's okay. It's okay. It yeah, happens. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Uh, and so um, I, I just got a, a, a little chat that I need uh, filler. And so this is uh, something about, apparently, about Leo, uh, presumably from someone that knows him, and that <laughs> he's keeping his sister awake for the three minute talk. Oh, yeah. Because it's the really <laughs> end for him. Like Hiroto, uh, I mean, I'm in near Japan, I'm in Korea right now, and it's 2.48 a.m., yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. you guys are doing well. I haven't seen you drink coffee since we did check-in. That's impressive. Oh yeah, well, I haven't, yeah, it's, it's, it's a little tough, but it's all right. <laughs> we'll live. <laughs> well, thanks for sticking with us, both of you. Yeah, no problem, yeah. All right. I'm going to put my mouse on the other side of my desk so I don't bump it. <laughs> All right. Um, apparently I did. Okay. Give the judges a few more seconds. Mm -hmm. You hear me? Yep, sounds good, Jer. Perfect, sounds good. All right, so I will introduce our last speaker. Um, this is the last one for the day. And again, just a reminder to stick around for the uh, People's Choice Award vote after. Um, I'm very excited to introduce my lab mate and good friend, Jared Lee, who is an MS mechanical engineering student at Georgia Tech. Jared, you are spotlighted and ready to go. Can you count the amount of movements you made today? Do you remember how many times you sat down, stood up, lifted something or dropped something and had to retrieve it? If you can, you could uh, applause react in the Zoom call because that's amazing. And I definitely can't remember. <laughs> it's often taken for granted how easily we can move our bodies. Everyday movements are often thoughtless. Unfortunately, many people working manual labor jobs risk losing this understated luxury every day. Construction, warehouse work, and other similar jobs require repetitive heavy lifting, compressing the lumbar spine and overworking low back muscles, which causes chronic low back pain. Furthermore, Common tasks that require asymmetric movements involving twisting the torso induce greater spinal instability, elevating risk factors. With low back pain, previously effortless movements become painful chores. 
It's been described by OSHA as the United States' top workplace health concern, and the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics found that nearly 39% of all work-related musculoskeletal disorders involve the lower back in 2016. So what's being done about all this? Recently, wearable robotic technology has become a popular solution. By applying mechanical power to a wearer, exoskeletons can significantly decrease the activation of lumbar muscles, which is tied to reduced spinal compression. Although effective in specific cases, there are numerous trade-offs. On one hand, powered exoskeletons involving motors and rigid frames can provide lots of assistance, but are heavy and constraining. And on the other hand, passive exosuits that don't need power sources are much lighter and freer, but are limited in assistance by properties of passive elements such as springs or dampers. Most importantly, many devices, both powered and passive, are designed to assist purely symmetrically, which doesn't represent most common practical lifting conditions. My research is focused on creating wearable devices that use the best aspects of both passive and powered exos to assist both symmetrically and asymmetrically. This led to the device shown on the bottom right of my slide, the asymmetric back exosuit or ABEX. The cool thing about ABEX is that it uses active motors to drive cables across the lower back, effectively working like a powerful external muscle group parallel to lumbar muscles, which offloads compressive force from lifting. When the user, user initiates lifting, the motors spool up the cables, creating tension that pulls the user back up to neutral standing position. The cables cross so that the left thigh is connected to the right shoulder and vice versa, creating an X pattern. This does something interesting with asymmetric lifting. The cables follow the torso twist as the user bends down, then the motors untwist the cables, moving the user back up to neutral standing position. Our lab is currently studying this design and early results show that during an extreme 180 degree lift, which is outside the operating range of the vast majority of exos, ABEX is able to reduce lumbar muscle activation by up to 30%. While these results are very preliminary, we're eager to see how these des this design fares with more subjects. As my research continues, I'm excited to optimize this design to provide a practical solution to the widespread issue of low back pain. With the evolution of this technology, hopefully every working person will be able to keep their movements effortless. Thank you very much. Great job, Jared. All right. So it, okay. That was the All last right. speaker, right? Yes, indeed. So it's just stall a minute, give the judges kind of their last thing, and then I believe just to Yeah, and I think as they're judging, we can probably introduce the People's Choice Award vote here. Yep. So um, we're going to be publishing a poll in just a second, and it should pop up on your Zoom screen. So just as a quick recap, um, these were all of the talks that you saw today. And when that Zoom poll does come up, you'll see the number followed by the name of the presenter. So if you remember either of those, that should help with the vote. Um, and this is just to gauge the favorite talk of the audience, so the one that captured the most of your attention. And this will, again, be announced with both the winner and runner-up chosen by the judges at the ASB business meeting and closing meeting at the end of the conference on Friday. So once we stir this up, we are going to give everyone about two minutes to answer and the results will be secret until revealed on Friday. So we won't Great. release the poll after everyone's done. Can you do the poll while I'm still screen sharing? I guess we'll find out. Um, that is a great question if it pops up on yours. If it does, stop screen sharing right away. Yeah, okay. And hopefully. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna launch the poll. And again, the numbers correspond with the slides on the screen, so please vote for your favorite talk. Great, Andy, I do not see the poll, so we should be okay. Okay, you don't, I do. Great, good, as long as we don't see it on the screen share, that should be good. Okay. Oh, I see. Gotcha. Yeah, it's a se it's separate. All right. So we're seventy five percent, seventy seven percent. All right, getting close. Uh, we got another, it's, we get, you said two minutes, right? So it looks yeah, like there's about like, two minutes. Yeah, so we're, there's six of, six people out there that haven't voted. <laughs> I guess it, it could be me and you, so. That is uh, true. We'll just, just wait another 
you said two minutes, so if anyone... Yeah. Yep, and then we'll kind of talk about some final details after we close this poll down. So if you want to stick around for just a few more minutes, we'll talk about where to find the candidates after this. All right. Looks like we're missing three votes. I think there's a chance that's uh, me, Andy, and our health tech person. So let's see. I'm just gonna just screenshot making sure these I... really quick. Can you see it, Jenny, too? The poll? Yeah. Okay. Yep. And I'm going to take a picture with my phone just in case. Yep, yep. that's what I just my did. My screenshots don't work. Great. All right. It looks like. Yep, it says 100% voted, so we're going to end the poll. And great. Hopefully no one can see that. I didn't share the results, so we should be good to go. Um, so great. As a conclusion, thank you so much to everyone for coming. We want to give a specific thank you to our judges, both for the preliminary and final round. Uh, we could not have gotten through so many awesome candidates during the preliminary round to get here without them. And same for this, we really look forward to seeing what the results are on Friday. Um, just as a reminder, because there was no Q&A, feel free to head over to that discussion channel in Slack. Um, and also, we have been directed that we can head over to the Qualsys sponsored spatial chat after this, if you want to talk to some of the candidates about their talks. So I encourage everyone to head over there in the meantime, if you don't have anything else on your schedule. So Andy, do you have anything to add? No, again, I just want to, to uh, mirror what Jenny said, thanking everyone, uh, the judges and all the presenters. And again, I apologize for any slight technical issues on our end, um, but I uh, feel like it went pretty smooth. Um, and make sure, um, I'm assuming that there'll be the standard evaluation um, of the conference or some modified version of it. So if you like the competition, if you think it's something that you, um, think it would be valuable to have next year. Any suggestions, modifications, please just include them. You're also, you know, free, feel free to reach out to us directly, but if you can put them in the evaluation, um, that would help the, you know, organizers for next year. Other than that, uh, enjoy the rest of your virtual ASB meeting and hopefully see everyone next year in person. Yeah, great. Great job presenters. Thanks everyone for coming. All right. See ya.